Welcome to the CSI Skill Tree. In this series, we take a close look at video games to examine and celebrate the work they do in envisioning the future and building rich, thought-provoking worlds. My name's Joey Eshrick at Arizona State University's Center for Science and the Imagination, and I'll be your host. And today we're going to talk about Hypnospace Outlaw, which is a 2019 game published by No More Robots and developed by Tendershoot, uh, which is a core team of just six people. It's going to become like poignant and meaningful very shortly. Uh, the game was initially funded uh, by a Kickstarter campaign, actually, and was a finalist for the Seamus McNally Grand Prize at the Independent Game Awards uh, in 2019 when it came out. And you can play it pretty much anywhere. So it, it works on Windows and Mac computers. You can play it on a number of consoles. So the Switch, Xbox, or uh, PlayStation consoles. And the game presents as a fully interactable 1990s style computer operating system called Hypnospace. And it plunges you into an alternate version of the internet that users engage with while they're sleeping using a, a headset. It begins with your orientation as a volunteer community moderator for this uh, online network, Hypnospace. And in that role, you are tasked with investigating allegations of copyright infringement, uh, abusive behavior, and other purported digital violations. And you're paid then in, in small amounts of Hypnocoin, which is a digital currency that you're told over and over again is not exchangeable for cash. And uh, through this role as an enforcer, you're, you're given a window into a world and complete these assignments and unfold the history, culture, and corporate machinations uh, of Hypnospace. And uh, as we'll discuss, the game has just like an astounding amount of original writing, art, and music. And that's especially impressive, I think, because the core creative team is so small. Uh, the gameplay blends puzzle solving. It's actually, I think, a really, really hard puzzle game um, with kind of exploration and immersion in the sense that you're using a kind of virtual desktop computer as you play. Um, and so much of the time you're browsing the web. You're looking for clues, making connections, figuring out who knows who, and getting to know the users that kind of make up this hypnospace community. Um, and so today we're going to delve more deeply into the aesthetics and gameplay, explore how Hypnospace Outlaw builds its fictional world through an overlapping set of digital interfaces. We'll discuss how the game examines nostalgia, health, labor, community, and online safety, and, and finally ponder whether playing it leaves one hopeful or gloomy about the potential of digital spaces to connect people and support self-expression. And to do that, I need help. So uh, I'm fortunate to have two amazing guests with me. Um, the first is Catherine Buse, who is an assistant professor of cinema and media studies and a researcher at the Committee on Environment, Geography, and Urbanization at the University of Chicago. Hi, Catherine. Hi. Catherine was also uh, a guest expert on the second episode of CSI Skill Tree, which you should go back and watch it. Uh, we discussed the space exploration and astrobiology platformer game, Waking Mars. So uh, go find that uh, when we finish with this. Um, I'm also honored to be joined by Ranjad Singh Dhaliwal, who is the Ruth and Paul Idzik Collegiate Chair in Digital Scholarship and Assistant Professor of English and Film, TV, and Theater at the University of Notre Dame. So Ranjad, hi. Hi. Thank you both for being here. I know you're both, I should say, uh, frequent collaborators with, with one another, and you, you conduct research and teach about games, but also do game design and production work, including developing um, Fold It First Contact, which is a narrative version of the protein folding citizen science game Fold It. So that's kind of a mouthful, but uh, developing narratives and digital interfaces for games. And so I think that makes you uniquely well suited to be here to help me disentangle this game, hopefully. Uh, so, you know, without any further ado, uh, let's get underway. And I just really appreciate both of you being here. Um, Catherine, I'm going to charge you if I can with, with, with starting us off and, and maybe just describing the experience of, of playing Hypnospace Outlaw, like how the game works and, and maybe how, uh, you started to get your head around it and investigated the early cases, uh, that you're, you know, that you're given, um, as an enforcer. So um, I identify in life that is as a social media lurker and uh, as such the like gameplay experience for me was very familiar. Uh, it's a lot of kind of browsing around this social media platform where you're kind of an outsider and you're like looking at these communities and trying to uh, figure out how they're connected to each other and what's going on. 
But to describe like the sort of gameplay loop, uh, I think I'm just going to explain the first case that you play in the game, which is really like quick and uh, simple compared to the other ones. Uh, it's a content infringement case where you're supposed to be tracking down these like supposedly proprietary images of a cartoon character called Gumshoe Gooper, which is kind of like a fish that looks like a detective, if that makes sense, in a, in a detective coat and often with like a magnifying glass. And you're supposed to find these images and take them down in a kind of DMCA uh, takedown notice style. Um, and you start to discover that all of the images of Gumshoe Gooper that you can find as an enforcer are on like one of the various social networks within Hypnospace, which is called Good Time Valley. And its icon is an American flag and it has this tagline that reads, for those who remember how things used to be, and then it talks about like home cooked meals, quote, good music and putting in a hard day's work. So I think it's supposed to remind us of maybe like my parents' generation, like people who are nostalgic for what they imagine as a simpler time. Uh, and it makes sense that they would like to sort of share uh, old cartoon images like Gumshoe Gooper in a way. Um, so it's also like a funny community because it's fairly disorganized and confused in part because a lot of the users seemingly don't really know how to use the uh, like site. And so there's a lot of like strange web design where someone's just typing like questions into the uh, web page or what have you, because they don't realize that it's not interactive and it's not gonna answer them, that kind of thing. Anyway, so as an enforcer, you uh, get paid every time you find an image of this fish and flag it for removal. And then you see it like removed from the, uh, it's like a broken image slot on the site, it gets taken away. And this is sort of where every time that you do anything enforcement wise in Hypnospace Outlaw, it actually ends up being something sort of philosophical in the end. So when you, mm -hmm. when you uh, find this teacher who's done a whole exercise, like a classroom exercise with their first grade class about like safety and a safety based episode of Gumshoe Gooper, and then had them all draw artworks about Gumshoe Gooper. And you realize you can just make absolute bank if you flag all of these kids drawings as like content infringement but at the same time it feels kind of messed up to do that because it's very clear that like from a legal slash ethical perspective perhaps like uh someone's uh what's the word original rendering of a cartoon character mm -hmm. is probably not actually car content infringement uh but right you do it you make a ton of money and then it's like case closed uh, and then you get your next case sent to your inbox, which is basically like an email platform. Yeah, it does, I mean, that. it does kind of like, uh, like you said, it, it gets very philosophical very quickly. Um, you start to be like, well, is this fair use? And to what extent, you know, do we need shared reference points in our culture to kind of like build affinity in these online spaces? And and yet, you know, uh, your bread is buttered on the side of reporting these violations. And uh, like you said, the, you're you're kind of not only like removing that content, but kind of breaking this this poor person's web page. And she seems totally nice and is not trying to make money. So it's like it reminds me very much of the way that um, archive of our own and like fan communities uh, yeah. want to be able to make use of things that are meaningful to them. But like, of course, the internet infrastructure is kind of set up to disincentivize that and to turn you into the game's titular outlaw if you just start to do these seemingly kind of um, benign, uh, normal feeling behaviors um, in digital spaces. So, uh, Ranjo, I'm hoping you can kind of help uh, give us some more context to build on on Catherine's experience and that that helpful walkthrough of kind of the core gameplay loop um, by talking about the game as a sequence of interfaces. So uh, as I said, like Hypnospace is presented as an operating system that you experience while you're sleeping. It's it's sort of a wearable technology because there's a headset. So I, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about the game's kind of cascade of interconnected interfaces and and how that connects to the, the narrative, but also how you actually go through and play and navigate the game and, and maybe what the game even has to say about like how interfaces create realities or open up and close off types of possibilities and behaviors as we've, as we've started to talk about with this uh, infringement case. Yeah, no, I mean, I think uh, the coolest thing about the game is the fact that it's uh, essentially itself an interface and it's very conscious about it. 
so often when we play other games, they come in some kind of a box, right? Like, I mean, there'll be a menu at the beginning and then you'll load game and you'll save game and so on and so forth. Um, so the games are almost always interfaces, but they're not really uh, usually reflecting on the fact that they are interfaces. But this one does. So the whole gameplay is completely structured and sutured through interfaces. So um, in the story, of course, you're probably, uh, you know, using a headset and logging on to this uh, OS, um, which is a specific kind of instance because it's clear that other people don't have the enforcer powers, the ones who are actually using it. So you're a special case, you have a special interface. Um, but all you can do in the game is via an interface, right? So um, every time you make a decision or every time you are able to interact with someone, it's usually in very structured, formal manners that you should use like buttons and, um, you know, clicks of a certain kind, dragging things and so on and so forth. Um, you do have the ability to access the keyboard, especially for searching. Uh, but it is, again, a specific textual form of like, oh, I can search the internet, but it's not like as if, uh, like the chat function, for example, is closed off to you. Uh, so, which makes... Yeah, they stuff. handle that quickly. You're an enforcer, you can't chat with anyone, but everybody else is theoretically able to chat. And so you're right, left but, out, like Catherine said. Yeah, but like by making that choice, I think they, they close off, the developers close off an interesting technical problem that would have arise by like having to, you know, then you'll have to build in a sort of a response system, some kind of quasi AI system. Uh, but now it, everything's interfaces. So it's like the operating system looks like Windows, like maybe like 95 or 98 Windows. Mm -hmm. I think after that, like 98 perhaps. Um, you know, there's like elements, uh, there's bugginess, uh, there's a web browser, which is a specific kind of browser you have, there's email, there's like a, you know, recycle bin. So things that we are all otherwise as players perhaps uh, aware of, or at least know from the recent past, if we don't use them ourselves these days, I mean, everything's app-based now. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think what the game is really good at doing by all of this interface is like actually, and this dives in with, uh, goes well with what Catherine was saying about sort of making you think about it, because each time you look for something, you only have a certain number of options for enforcement. Um, yeah. So you have to be like, oh, this is what I'm looking for. It's, you know, this is a this is a copyright infringement versus this is extra legal stuff, or this is like cash that is, you know, real life money is being exchanged. So I have to select that option. So by constraining all of your choices in these ways, interfaces in the game, and I think by extension, because the game makes you think about all of these other things, um, are able to cordon off the possibility of what you can and cannot do in this supposedly, you know, wide, wild world. I mean, outlaw is in the is, is in the name um, of the game. Um, but so, I mean, I think in some ways it's it, to to me it was really fascinating because I often have this experience uh, of both myself and other people that I uh, tag along with when you know, you play with older computers from like 1980s or 70s, that you're almost always taken up, taken enamored by like the interfaces. You're like, oh, why is this so slow? Why is this so, like, I wasn't expecting it to work this way. Why do I have to do this? And the game is very, very good, I think in some ways at uh, sort of telling you that you might not think about it, but that usually is the boundaries of the world. And you have to think about what boundaries you want to cross, what boundaries you don't want to cross. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your role when it comes to structures and interfaces and forms? Yeah, it even like, um, it makes you feel, I, I felt weird sometimes because I'm very bad at puzzles. So I, I was like, just sometimes searching like just terms that I thought would help solve the puzzle because you can search in all these people's different web pages. And like, I would end up finding something that I, would later find out was like from a, a, a future sort of chapter or case. But then it was like, I didn't feel good about that because I was like, well, I'm on the wrong track. It's not that I've like uncovered an Easter egg. So it's your point, you're hitting up a boundary where I was like, okay, now there's this other spot or like this page seems to like be filled with meaningful text of some sort. You know, it just feels too ornate to be accidental um, or ornamental. But, but uh, yeah, like you can't do much with that. Like you kind of do have to figure out a pretty prescribed set of connections, but you're doing it in such, like you said, a sort of wild and feral and seemingly open landscape that it 
it feels easy to get lost, but then you're bumping up against what you're able to do because you're on this forked version of the OS where you can't respond to emails or chat. Like you can only kind of, like you said, click a specific number of buttons and uh, customize a small number of interfaces. Yeah. In, in, in some ways, actually, I think what the interfaces are doing here is that it's providing, the game is providing us this like idea of like a wild world, but the interfaces are the constraints that tell us that just because the world exists, you can't do everything, right? So it thinks everything spatially, like all these communities, mm. zoning, um, space, which is again in the, in the title. Uh, but then the interface is what constrains the space in some ways. Like here is, you know, I may search, but if I, if I don't have a comprehension of what I'm doing right now, or I'm just like browsing through the world, then I will not be able to do much because the interface only allows me to do like three things or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Catherine, I see you nodding. I'm wondering if you have a follow-up comment or I have a thought for you, if not. I think this might come up later, but I'm thinking about how in the game, like Ranjit was talking about space. And I think as I've prepared for this conversation, I've realized how important the idea of like cyberspace is to the like underlying ontology of this game. Ontology is maybe <laughs> not a necessary word to explain what I'm talking about at all, but uh, you know, whatever it's saying about the world. Mm -hmm. And like, then it occurred to me that all of the zones that the people are in, when we talk about community, we can talk about this more, that like what they do and the fact that people's pages are like sorted within them. Anyway, we'll get back to it, I think. Well, let's talk about, I think we should just jump ahead because I, okay. I really welcome that to talk about community. I think it's essential. So yeah, do you want to just talk to us a little bit about the, the um, you talked about um, the first community that you en encounter, but could you talk a little bit more just like about um, the social spaces that structure this world and uh, how it imagines the workings of um, digital communities and and how you learn about and kind of start to interact with them and observe them. Mm -hmm. So you start with a uh, good time valley. That's the yeah. or that's the one that I was talking about. There's also a place called the Teen Topia, and that's mm -hmm. obviously for teenagers. And there's uh, the cafe, which is sort right, of there's... which seems to be like Hypnospace's parent company's sort of approved starting point network. Like it has some of their employees yeah. on it and stuff. It's like generic professionals is who I take go. to be in the cafe. <laughs> uh, but it's also like, yeah, generic. Then there's open-eyed, which is like the new age community. Then there's the, uh, what else is there? There's a uh, Starport Castle Dream Station, which we only learn about later, but basically mm -hmm. it's a combination of a bunch Good of memory. different fandoms. Yeah. Uh, I'm actually cheating by looking at the Hypnospace fandom wiki. There's also uh, <laughs> the Cool Punks, right? They have their own yeah, this the music cool scene paradise. called Cool Punk, which is de dedicated to like winter and cold temperatures and snowboarding mm -hmm. and uh, lo-fi kind of. Uh, and that has its own little community, little neighborhood. I don't know about the lo-fi part. Parts of it are kind of like lo-fi. I don't know. You're you're seeing my limited musical vocabulary here. <laughs> I should say it's you all also right. like based on paying homage to or subverting a soda company's jingle like that's the basis for the whole genre so uh -huh. um, and it's like winter and christmas themed as well so it's like a you. very niche genre but it's the only music page on the home page mm -hmm. uh so that's interesting but yeah so with I these guess communities the like you were talking about space and like how important the metaphor i guess the gibsonian metaphor of cyberspace was for kind of making sense of all this, I guess, or navigate, learning how to navigate through it. Yeah. Could you say more well, about that? Ranjit was saying that like the interface is kind of the whole world or like maybe what Hypnospace wants us to realize is that the way that these like platforms set the world up ends up determining so much of what's capable of happening on them, but in ways mm. that we end up taking for granted uh, in normal life. Like, you know, we don't think about the way Instagram works versus the way Facebook works when we, we just have the social networks that we like and we don't think about their form being part of that always and so to me like the fact that there are these zones which are like these spatialized niche interest groups but they're like very not parallel with each other like there's you know the mm -hmm. one that's for like older people maybe it's uh, the boomer and, network come on <laughs> yeah i was trying to be sensitive to <laughs> whatever uh yeah boomer network there's like the teen network then there's like one weird musical genre then there's like all nerds geeks whatever geek culture uh mm -hmm. and it's and then there's like professionals 
And like, that's not, those are not parallel with each other. But right. in this particular social network, it's like the people's web homepages are sorted within mm -hmm. these like interest groups so that mm -hmm. you will not see someone in Teentopia if you're in Good Time Valley or what have you. Yeah. Uh, and so I thought that spatialization and like kind of materializes something that also happens in other social networks, but like not so literally or so absurdly that like, you know, oh, my homepage is just in the cool punk, you know, section, meaning that I never see anyone but other cool punks. Yeah. I, can I jump in? Please do. Yeah. I was hoping yeah. you would. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's funny that like, actually the only time that the interface really sort of is called into question is when it the whole screen physically moves and you feel oh, very yeah. instability here right like i mean again like it's it's early on enough the game that doesn't feel like a spoiler but like um you get a virus at some point of time because again, yep. you sure a lot do. Of viruses, um in the game and um, your your screen literally starts getting less and less usable uh so you only notice the difference uh, that an interface makes uh, when it breaks. And I think it's also true as, as Catherine was put, putting so articulately um, that like when Facebook or Instagram, when like when something changes, when they're like, well, we changed this part to like not do this thing, that's when there's all the outrage, right? But mm -hmm. on a daily basis, when it keeps on going, you just kind of like absorb that information into your head and keep going with it. So they kind of like the interfaces become these like uh, constraints in our head that we we don't not normally uh, think about. I think the other cool thing here, I mean, this is again connected to the communities part that Catherine was talking about. In some ways, uh, I was just thinking when you were talking about all these like parallel things, like you probably are not a teen in a teen topia and also in the Good Time Valley makes me just think about like the, um, you know, the, the the kind of bubbles that we live in, except in this case, right. the bubbles are very explicit, right? I mean, we know that recommendation mm -hmm. systems in actual internet that we use mean that you and I, if we share a, a hobby, might be in some kind of algorithmic bubble that does not, uh, you know, collapse with other algorithmic bubbles where, you know, boomers are having their own good time valley on Facebook, but um, that doesn't like in the game. It's very explicit, and I think it, that makes you actually think about like how how these communities operate and what they take for granted. Yeah, it makes me think of two things. One is that you know now we're we're used to like the Reddit model maybe for uh, forums, and and um, we could call mm -hmm. them like t t typed spaces maybe. Uh, right. which is like, you could be a member of a number of them. Right. And your identity, you know, your avatar can float between those spaces and carries its history with it. But like in this, it, it actually reminds me a little bit of something that AOL did in the, in the early internet to make the internet more usable and tractable when it was um, feeling new and, and kind of befuddling for all of us. And it was that it had almost like these neighborhoods. So you could be geographically bound in certain ways you could be and you and you'd be building a homepage that was that was part of that neighborhood it was part of the um you know spatialized digital infrastructure of 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 a place that you know if you were in the boston uh neighborhood and aol and if you were from um you know tulsa you may not i think you could go into it but like you may not like it would make you know you weren't encouraged to do that um and that in turn reminds me you know when you two talked about facebook and instagram and the outcry when interface elements get changed, deleted, rethought. We're encouraged so often to think of these internet spaces as like communities of people. And you, you see that in this game too. There's this tension between, um, mm -hmm. are we just gathering together uh, in a virtual space or are we participating in kind of um, an, an architecture where we have to move through a set of rooms and we have a, a certain number of verbs that we're allowed to engage with um, when an interface changes, when Facebook gets rid of an interaction or moves a button or, or, or something like that, or merges messages with DMs with other kinds of messages, it reminds us that we're actually navigating this maze of features instead of like just talking to people, which is, I think, what we're often encouraged. You know, Twitter used to trumpet itself as like the digital public square, which evokes an image of us all just like being in the same place you know, engage in a collective dialogue when in fact what we're doing is like, like in this game, navigating a bunch of somewhat arcane interface layers that we're like learning how to use over time and getting reinforced in as we continue to use them. 
that was meant to be more of a question than a comment, but of course that ended no, up. No, it was being great. Um, I, I mean, I guess one thing I I wanted to ask about was about to get back to your experiences and sort of reactions to the game, which is to say, I think this game is overtly packaged and promoted as being a nostalgic object just in some sense or a throwback object. I think it is actually set in a sort of alternative past for the internet. It is set, you know, I think in the nineties, but it, it is a, a different 1999 with a, a slightly different version of the internet and presumably a different trajectory. I mean, clearly you easily forget, um, Ranjad, this gets to what you were saying about like the interface and the power it has, because it's like, you easily forget that you're, that you're supposed to be asleep. Cause I kept thinking like, well, this was just like using an old computer, but I was like, all oh, right, I'm asleep. And like, you know, <laughs> subconsciously navigating this using a headset, not a mouse. Um, but I, I, did you too feel nostalgic when you played this game? Did it, um, it, it or, or did it feel like it was kind of a, a more of mired in commentary on the present that it was, that it was that idea of like speculative fiction is always about commenting on the moment that we're living through now, or did, did it really feel like it was recreating some remixed version of older environments or the aspirations of them or the feel, you know, the emotion of the space that, that the internet put you in at an earlier uh, epic. Yeah. How did that compute for you, for you too, I guess? Can I go, Catherine? Yeah, I, I absolutely was smitten. I think um, I am, um, I don't want to say fan, but I'm always like interested in like, Vaporwave, Chillwave aesthetics. Um, I mean, I think they're, they emerge from a very bizarre uh, subculture of the internet. Uh, and they emerge, of course, you know, later thinking about the past, the 80s and 90s in, in that case. Uh, but the game, I think, does a, a good job sort of imitating those aesthetics and then putting things that we know, whether it's like, um, certain design choices or whether it's even certain terms that we kind of associate with things, right? I mean, there is Merchant Soft that evokes Microsoft, um, but then the micro is replaced by Merchant, which itself um, invokes like a certain kind of like, oh, is this a com commercial system? Like, is commerce happening on it or is commerce the selling of it? Um, so it, even with the wordplay, I think it does all of these things, but the aesthetics itself, like it's completely 90s nostalgia. It is set in 1999. So it's the late 1999 that you're playing. Um, and I think it's, it's, uh, it's really sort of presenting, um, you know, um, a, a, a kind of a web page that has been lost in some ways. Like at the, you know, I'm thinking of GeoCities, I'm thinking of like mm. all those like early bizarro web pages that um, I know Catherine and I both share an interest in just because of how weird they were. Um, but I, uh, you know, I've, I've always had this plan that like on my uh, website, like my own website, like I will uh, make like a version of it that is like a GeoCities version. And I like still have a tab on it that says 1990s and it stays coming soon, which is also a very 90s trope of like something's always in the future. Uh, but <laughs> I've never been able to actually do it only because I realized that it's going to take much more effort than I uh, had initially thought when I envisioned it. So to create like, you know, to go back to like HTML of that time, um, if you pick up like, you know, a design book today, it's just, it's, it's not the same. Like you're looking at many other layers that have come in between that like purport to make things easier um, and make things a certain aesthetic. So this game actually, I think does a really good job of capturing that older uh, time, which only makes me think about like all the effort that they have, must have gone through to actually recreate that. Um, you know, the, the the resolution of the game is 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 clearly uh from another era altogether but i think one of the things that it also made me think about was the fact that nostalgia is kind of different for different people so good time valley is in some ways on the, is like those are people being nostalgic for a different time mm. whereas once the plots of the game progress, you realize that people may be nostalgic for like Net Settler, which was the thing right before uh, Hypnospace. And then as plot progresses, you realize that people are actually nostalgic for like early version of Hypnospace when like, you know, some things were not happening or something. 
in in any case like i think it's it's a the the, the game despite having this clear marker like 90s that it puts you in an alternate 90s um nevertheless is uh very careful about the fact that like nostalgia isn't one thing nostalgia is many things um and it lets you kind of like pick and choose about like which of these nostalgias are are you into are you into like sort of homesteading things or like i don't know like net settler which is also like you know certain frontier vision uh or are you into sort of teen topia you know um how well do you relate with like Y2K fears or like misinformation or viruses or picking between uh, whether to choose McAfee or Norton for your antivirus software because that was apparently like the biggest decision I could have taken mm -hmm. when I was like 11. <laughs> oh my God. If I buy Avast, I think I am doomed. I have to get the money for McAfee or like buy a pirate, like get a pirated version or something of that sort. Uh, I don't know, Catherine. <laughs> I couldn't have said it better myself. The only thing that feels like now about this game is maybe like the hallucinatory quality, like the fact that you're mm. supposed to be asleep, uh, which I yeah. think would explain something about how social media expresses this like, mm. Mm. there's this, <laughs> there's this sense that like the unconscious of the human mind contains monsters. <laughs> and yeah. I think that sense is like expressed in social media and it's also expressed in this game but in this game there's the explanation that people aren't actually awake and potentially that means that people are like expressing some kind of deep self that is not uh you know what they would choose in their waking life uh and I think that's an interesting way to read like Twitter as well so I don't know the, the freshest part of it to me is the question of like what is the relationship between what we do on the internet and like who we are uh yeah. and is it one-to-one -one? yeah the additional wrinkle that i want to bring up that maybe relates to that catherine but perhaps more to the nostalgia the, the points of nostalgia that uh Ranjod was bringing up is is actually in teen topia because i'm probably about the right age to have to feel like oh like i i was a teenager when like this game was supposedly happening i was a young teenager but i um there was a sense that like you could get in a lot of trouble online, but there was also um, and then there was a lot of drama, you know, like the, the, and there you see that in Teen Topia, the, 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 these younger people, they're they're sort of fighting, they're breaking up, there's feuds, there's people trying to impress other people, sometimes by doing very destructive things. There's like a slam book that you end up getting access to, basically, or it's kind of like a an, I don't know, it's a hypnospace newsletter that makes fun of people. Um, and there's a lot of kind of performative edginess and. But that sense too, that like things that you do when you're young and it ends up like without saying too much, like the young people end up like being really important in the uh, fate and future of this entire ecosystem. Um, and it's kind of for trivial teenage reasons, um, as far as you can tell uh, in, in large part, that sense of like the internet is, is dangerous, but the internet is this place for experimentation and like really, um, unfettered self-expression. I think that like is a point that I can say that people in my mini generational cohort are nostalgic for. I think it in some ways is mm -hmm. a kind of false and constructed nostalgia, but just the idea that you can have these, each web page as a result of the architecture we were talking about feels really different. I mean, it feels like you are going into someone's subconscious, Catherine, like when you, and, and I guess you are literally in the game, but you know, somebody's page has, you know, got this like, uh, skunky rock music and flames and another person's is like, uh, you know, uh, very tranquil and, and calm. Other people are, are, are really talking down to other users. Um, other people are trying to be pro-social and helpful or sort of really cheerful. Um, everybody's trying to like really kind of zero in on who they are and make sure they're expressing themselves exactly how they want. And the interface in theory in space like allows for that kind of creative palette. Whereas now I think we've been talking in terms of other social networks that like Ranjod, you said early on are, are kind of appified, that there's the, the containers are really well-defined. And it made me think of when you tried to make your website, you know, it's hard not to do a WordPress or Squarespace type treatment for a website. I mean, the whole internet is sort of built to, to deliver those interfaces. And, and so there's this sense of like extreme opportunities for self-expression, but also like pretty considerable opportunities to like get yourself into trouble, um, in legal jeopardy, things like that. And that it's not that that's gone now, but I think like the, the, uh, 
the way the internet's been cordoned off into spaces and designed within an inch of its life and color palleted uh, in, a, in a sort of universally pleasing way feels like we've lost something. But I think the game the game is is both trying to grab at that nostalgia, but also kind of puncture it a little bit by showing that it's all it was all you know, for the same kinds of profit motives that exist today, that like you can have very different design treatments for the same kind of like capitalist accumulation agenda. Catherine? Can I say something now that I was going to say later, but I'll just instead I'd pass at a later point? Okay, so I think that point about profit motive is so great. And also I think your point about like the more layers of possible self-expression and kind of like heinous eye searing things that can come from that, but also <laughs> the fact that that's currently impossible, meaning that like, uh, we've maybe lost the opportunity to be able to make such eye searing decisions uh and maybe we want those back or could yeah. imagine a world where those never left anyway i think that in teentopia is the place where we see the only thing that i would say like so many people are expressing themselves creatively in the game but the one thing that feels like genuine art of the kind that i as like a cultural critic would like write about in a journal article or whatever that one of the player characters is doing happens there and it happens in this like really horrifying subversive way where like one of the teens uh, I might be giving away something I shouldn't no you but, should just give away something like, like you know okay one yeah. of the teens like basically creates this computer virus but the purpose of the computer virus is to it's almost like documentary about people mm -hmm. that the teen has stalked in the other communities. So the teen has gone into like Good Time Valley and like learned a lot about some of the other characters and has gone into some of the other communities and is doing these like weird documentary, creepy, like uh, impressionistic portraits of other people on the social network that they're really not supposed to have access to uh, or supposed to want access to anyway. And like, there's something about, something very subversive and troubling and interesting about what this teenager is doing because it's like they're invading space and they're like surveilling in these like uncomfortable ways, but it's also a way of breaking down the way that the network wants you to like stay bucketed in these like kind of corporate given like contextual lumps. Anyway, mm -hmm. I thought that was like super amazing and uh, an interesting example of like art for art's sake without a profit motive that comes up in the game when most of the game is really about like mourning the way that like art gets co-opted by uh, corporate or capitalist interests. It's also in some ways a redefinition of uh, art as it, you know, interfaces with these uh, interfaces, right? I mean, you're sort of like, um, like there is a work done to be a, that, art made but be uh that thing be classified as art like it's it's not evident in the first place but then you're like yeah that makes sense um and that is subversive and weird um right and, computer viruses aren't normally thought of as art yeah they should be i mean i, I guess in the hacking communities they have i mean you know exploits have always been thought of as art so virus is more like a moral thing that you put onto it you're like well this exploit was mm -hmm. bad uh, shouldn't do it, but exploits. I mean, there's a whole like you know, hacking has a good history and a bad history, and most mm -hmm. of the, much of the hacking history is actually, at least within the internalist account, good history. Like, yeah, we are showing like here are the flaws, and you should fix it, or like you know, we are doing this because this was bad and it needed to be done. Like, this is the activism, hacktivism stuff. Yeah. So I think in that case, if you think about it, less as a virus and more as an exploit makes easier to make that historical connection between mm -hmm. hacking as an aesthetic form, as an act, as a protest act or whatever, and mm -hmm. whatever theater you want to call it now. And yeah. the virus is called festering orifice. I know that's disgusting. <laughs> uh, and I think that the claim that the teenager is setting up in this piece of art is that like, as a, as an entity on a social media platform like this, we become this like gross mutated super organism like hive mind thing and that the different parts that are scattered across all these different bubbles are like actually part of one thing and that we need to like I don't know that there is a need to recognize that we're in a different genre than the genre we thought we were in and that we're actually in this horror genre where we're all one giant mm. meat meat creature <laughs> I well I love that because I do think the game does play with 
uh, with horror tropes. I mean, it is scary when your interface stops working because just like when you're reliant on your real computer, <laughs> you're like, I can't continue to to play, right? Like it it does feel. Um, and there's early on you get you you have to download this uh, digital helper that's actually a piece of adware. He's this like uh, kindly old man who just like serves you up ads when you ask him for help with the interface, and you know it's a case that you have to get into as an enforcer and it turns out the company that owns hypnospace wants to buy this adware and integrate it into the system but i you know i was like i don't want to download this 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 adware like it's going to break my computer and i won't be able to like you know do my thing and like uh you know open up more zones and so i i think once the virus um plot happens catherine it's it is a genre shift but it is also surfacing i think like like you said like it's surfacing things that are implicit in the way that the that people represent themselves online that 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 do verge on horror because they verge on like to what extent are we like our human selves when we're in these you know is it uncanny are we not really are we not really humans are we some other kind of digital or hybrid organism when we're when we're in these spaces and are the spaces morphing us and of course that only becomes more profound when you think about the fact that the game is again commodifying sleep and like actually um you know, attaching a, as we learn, um, without spoiling too much, potentially dangerous device to your, to your head and face and brain while you're supposedly resting. Mm -hmm. I think, um, to this conversation is making me realize, and I, I hadn't thought of it th this way before, but the, the viruses are the only moments or, or they're the key moments in the game where the community boundaries do break down because the viruses um, and exploits and um, things the users do to subvert the system are what actually causes like spatial blurring and boundary breaking. And they demonstrate or dramatize people sort of moving out of the spaces that they are supposed to be assigned to. Um, and that, I don't know, that's how the game is defining violation or an outlaw status in a certain way is like what what breaks the clean hierarchies that that merchants off the the company that owns Hypnospace is hoping you'll respect as you as you surf, I guess. Yeah, and I think it's 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 interesting that um you basically are tasked with maintaining those boundaries, like your goal as um, you know, the, the kind of role that you're set into. And I think it actually um, is evident in the first uh, Gamshu Grouper uh, episode that uh, Catherine mentioned, because like there is a detective uh, mm -hmm. figure that mm -hmm. you here are taking down after having looked for clues and searched for it. And here is he with a with a you know my uh, whatever a magnifying glass, and then you are there with a the magnifying glass looking at kids' paintings from first grade, being like, "Is this Gumshoe Cooper? Bad rendering, but looks like one, and maybe I can make bank." Um, so I think the, the 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 virus then is just in some ways like a you know this 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 counterpoint to what you're trying to contain, but you almost cannot, right? Like your work is to do the boundary policing uh, for the company for the platform. Um, but, you know, platforms, as Paul Edwards calls it, are like fast infrastructures. They're going to break. They're like fast. You can build them quickly, but then, you know, they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're not going to stick around for long. And I think uh, the, the viruses are what come in between when uh, things morph and move, uh, which are also kind of biological ways that you understand virus or a fair string or a fair for that matter. <laughs> So, uh, Catherine, if you if you want to add anything, I, I'd love that. But otherwise, I I will sort of shift, although not too far, to actually a conversation about work and labor uh, mm -hmm. in this game. I think that sounds great. Okay, good. Um, so yeah, I mean, Brunjo, you you rolled us into this uh, very helpfully. But this game, I I just need to put my cards on the table and say, like, I. Uh, I, I admire this game greatly. I did not find it very fun. I actually found it really, really hard and a little unsettling, but I remain wowed by the by the incredible writing and sound design. This game has, has gotten a lot of plaudits, especially for its sound design. I think the music and the, F, the sound effects are, are, are quite good, but it, it just is such a, a beautiful space to be in or sort of an, an overawing space to be in, in a way. Um, but you know, it's meant to feel like work. And I I don't think that my 
I struggled with feeling like, well, do I like this? And I was like, well, I don't know if this is a game that is meant to be enjoyed in that way. I think the narrative turns are really rewarding, but the the mechanics of it are are not fun because you're you're being a cop in an online space and no one likes you. Uh, and you're kind of an alienated worker and you're getting paid in this like company script. Um, and, but, but in that way, I think the game is centered on in some ways thinking about labor in digital spaces and like what labor looks and feels like, um, online, um, which is very nineties, but also very contemporary because it's a sort of like things that were starting to get set into motion, like these kind of volunteer moderator jobs that totally like did exist in in the earlier stages of the internet that kind of um labor has been really formalized and is essential to digital spaces today so and all this work is going on while you're sleeping too i just think that's worth like saying again like these people like <laughs> aren't you know they're probably not resting um so like i i wanted to hear you two um uh kind of talk through well your reactions like your reactions to my experience of the game and like how you felt playing it as a did it feel like work to play? And if so, was it fun to work while you played? But then like, what kinds of work are happening here? And like, what questions does the game open up or, or, or what like kind of answers does it offer, I guess, about, about what work looks like in digital spaces and like, what kinds of roles are we playing when we're participating in these like owned cyberspaces? Mm -hmm. Nothing, do you want to take a first stab or? I feel like this is a you question. I have things to say, but I'd rather hear what you have to say. <laughs> okay, then I'll take a first stab. I, I think uh, I I agree with your assessment. Uh, I mean, I'm a bad person to answer this question because I do actually like games where I work. And there are yeah. people who argue that uh, certain kinds of games are actually only stand-ins and training for actual work that we do in real life. Uh, so I don't mind the working while I'm gaming aspect because I also am almost always having like multiple screens open in my computer. So I'm always working while I'm gaming. Um, so, you know, the merger doesn't actually uh, distress me, but I do I do share uh, your assessment. I think it's, it's difficult and it's making it difficult because I mean, I, I think I already kind of mentioned it. I think the um the ability to set oneself in a different time period let alone an alternate history um requires significant sort of uh difficulty like that is mechanical difficulty which then generates questions be like oh why is this being difficult i mean there's a whole uh um subgenre of like game mechanics that are like you know fumble core for example like difficulty in games is an interesting problem i think that um, is not always to the detriment of the game. So I think that's what's yeah. happening. But I, yeah, I agree. I think the, the the labor question is also interesting because it's not, I mean, yes, the game provides us many different ways uh, in which labor works. So, you know, you have like, people are designing things, making music, people are critiquing all of that. There's, you know, commerce happening. So that at some point of time, there's possibly some actual money exchanging hands too. Mm -hmm. uh, but the labor that you're doing is policing, which is a specific mm -hmm. kind of work. Um, you know, it has a specific special relationship in at least in, you know, uh, history of capitalism. Like policing maintains things. Um, policing is supposed to um, keep things as they are. But then this is in some ways like volunteer maintenance that is happening here because, you know, you're being paid whatever company script uh so on the one hand i think it invokes like the moderation that is done voluntarily by communities like you know reddit still does it um or has to do it else you'll you'll get your subreddit uh banned or uh, on the other hand it sort of invokes like the stuff that is being outsourced to like you know the global south like facebook employees via intermediaries like thousands and thousands of like moderators who like flag content in like India and Brazil and Vietnam um, because, you know, you can get uh, labor for cheap there. Um, and I think there's a version of it in which like you're looking at all of this stuff uh, sort of, that's also supposed to be kind of, I think the difficulty, this is not a good job. Like this is not a glamorous mm -hmm. job, but nevertheless, it's a, it's a job where you are making sure that, uh, you know, the people who own the, 
uh, platform actually remain sort of uh, 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 an arm's distance away from yeah. the nitty gritties of what's happening on the platform. Like, so, you know, you're, you're, you're the one who's like taking uh, the role of main, making things as they are so that, you know, the rich people uh, who own the platform can like uh, one pawn off uh, tasks to you and have you do it, but also like uh, not have to engage with uh, the kind of emotional fallouts of like, you know, banning a kid's uh, cartoon drawing. Um, so yeah, there's all kinds of, I think, uh, labor implications. Uh, Catherine, now I wanna hear, <laughs> what do you have to say? Well, yeah, so there's like the claim that comes up pretty often about how like, when you think about a platform, like a social media platform, like the people who are making the content are the users. So in a sense, they're the ones doing the work. And in, sen in a sense, all of our leisure time that we spend online is like work when we're creating content, which is why I'm a lurker. Uh, <laughs> Cause I'm a shirker of work. Uh, and he says, interesting because he knows that's not really why it's just because I'm lazy. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, on the other hand, we can also see the people who are actually like working in the sense that it's their job to be on this platform in the game as well. Like the people who like the Gray's Peak Soda Company people who like manage the cool punk page or and try to keep it, you know, attached to their brand, even though it's like a social movement of some sort. And so it's kind of hard to keep it attached to their brand or the like uh, merchant brothers who are like uh, running and creating these corporate deals with like uh, different companies in hypnospace. And so there's like this like overlay of like real business work that's being done in an office maybe. Uh, and then at the same time, they're like the people who are like actually doing the work of like keeping this like a vital space. Um, and then there's the work that we as a player are doing like Joey said. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, I think what both of you were saying adds up to the, I like the phrase at arm's length. Again, we're being very spatial about everything here, but um, mm -hmm. that, you know, there is this um, set of legal questions about whether platform owners are publishers and they, they don't want to be considered publishers. And so the metaphor of a community, which we've been using here throughout, is kind of used as a way to disclaim responsibility for what's getting written on the platform, right? And then that's also the function of the subcontracting. That's the function of the volunteer moderator um, who's paid in an exchangeable digital currency that can buy virtual hamsters and desktop backgrounds and actually antivirus software. So it quickly <laughs> goes away as soon as you get it. Um, but what it does is it allows it allows these these to be classified legally as, as community spaces instead of as, um, you know, what might look more equ equivalent to like a, a really giant online magazine, um, which would mean different kinds of uh, expectations and different kinds of regulation. Um, so that's work too. Um, and Catherine, even lurking is work, right? You're looking at the ads. I mean, that's usually like, that's where a huge percentage of the monetization is happening too. So uh, these, no the scene. way that community may not be the right word, but that there, it, these are platforms that elicit and then require buy-in and participation and attention, right? I mean, that's where the phrase like attention economy comes from that like, you know, you if, if these things aren't being looked at, then they no longer have value. And that's, you can see the, the concern of your corporate overseers sometimes in this game that, you know, they're going to bleed users or that a controversy is going to drive people away um, as much as any other kind of technical problem. Everything is about kind of keeping the audience sutured into the experience. Yeah. I think it's also notable that the game is set in 1999 here. I mean, one, because implications of Y2K virus, early internet where things were wilder, but also like a moment of flux where on the one hand, you clearly have had the famous like section 230, 1996 ruling, the 26 words that made the internet that you refer to when uh, companies stopped being publishers and being responsible for the content on their websites, as long as there were enough mechanisms for plausible deniability of like the people doing things themselves. And so that's where I think a part of you stepping in here is like, well, you have to handle DMCA complaints. Um, so we can do that, but also like, you know, if we keep enough things then we ourselves don't get implicated, things that actually sh show up in the narrative later on. Um, and so, uh, you know, like it, it's also in some ways post 96, like that whole time, 
uh, and then moving on into early 2000s is the first time that the conversations about like, what are we doing when we are on the internet uh, where like somehow magically like a company gains value, like billions of dollars, but like it only has seven employees or whatever, right? Um, and so who, like how did seven employees make something worth billions? And the answer usually is that it's this kind of high mind. It's like all of us, like, you know, and that's that's kind of the argument that uh, Catherine was referring to, you know, the one made by Iziana Terranova that like we are, we are work, working, we are doing labor when, you know, you're stoning TikTok or whatever. Um, and then, you know, there's there's another meta version of the argument. It's not like just, oh, that when I am on the internet, I'm doing labor. But the fact that I have a profile there and the fact that like everybody around me is getting their information from the internet is at some other level also making me plugged into these modes of extraction that are happening, right? So like I might see an ad that is actually on uh, like a billboard outside, but then eventually three months later when I click on the website, it would have all fed in because I would have also three, seen three other ads on Twitter or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. So you know, Mauricio Lazzarato calls it cognitive capitalism, the fact that our brains mm -hmm. are now wired into this uh, uh, bizarre mega, mega structure. Um, and I think it's 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 fascinating that uh, the game is able to very like because it's set in this moment of flux it's able to pull these threads about like what will become only clear much later i mean you know in 90s yeah sure you have like geo cities or whatever like in their companies that you know the yahoo and ask jeeves and google but um it's not really like the world isn't this like this is a cordoned off area yeah. um but then eventually given the penetration of the internet that we have today and social media uh, I think the game is in some way sort of like by setting doing this alternate history, it's also retroactively able to be like, well, it kind of had its roots in there, right? Like when we mm -hmm. said that the companies are not responsible because they're not publishers, they're not responsible for the content, we kind of like sort of put ourselves down this path uh, of like uh, having intermediaries, subcontractors who sort of may give the owners a plausible deniability. So, you know, you get the you get the profits, but you don't really necessarily have to uh, think about all the ways in which things are going wrong and you have, don't have to deal with it yourself. And in, actually, in, in the case of this game, you explicitly get that when, like, I think it's already been brought up in the conversation, but uh, Professor Helper, mm -hmm. right? Professor Helper, so yeah. You, like, you... You're, you were not supposed to take Professor Helper down. Like, that's, that's not a part mm -hmm. of your, uh, you know, thing because the company Merchant Soft has a uh, sort of a quasi illicit backend interest in this clear adware virus program uh, that, you know, shakes your computer up. Um, and so you're supposed to turn blind eye to some things so that, yeah. um, you know, profits can be generated, but you're supposed to rigorously enforce other things so that the people who are generating profits don't get into trouble. It sounds an awful lot like what probably wasn't happening in 99, but what probably happened later. So it also plays with yeah. this in this way. Yeah. No, I really like that idea of of um that it's it's giving we're on the same pathway, but it's moving you a different point in that pathway. But all the same forces are still in operation, even if they're not quite as clear. Uh, I think that's really well put. Uh Catherine, any reactions before we move to our final summative question? No, I think I'm ready for the final summative question. <laughs> Well, this is a big one. So, and I teased it at the very beginning, um, which is, did playing Hypnospace Outlaw, does playing Hypnospace Outlaw make you feel ultimately hopeful or cynical about online spaces, our desires to connect in them as arenas for self-expression? Uh, does the game kind of feel like, or for you, your interpretation of the game, does it, does it feel like that these platforms are sort of ultimately pasted together and unworkable? Or are these utopian spaces that contain these glimmers of hope that are inextinguishable, even though they're kind of a mess and we know all of the uh, uh, machinations, to use a, wor a word that I used earlier, um, behind them? Utopia, dystopia, hopeful, cynical? Where do you feel like you've ended up uh, at the end of this experience or in the midst of it if you're still working through it? I think Hypnospace Outlaw believes that people are essentially good. Mm. Uh, 
but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's optimistic, if that makes sense. So I think it shows over and over that people have this like authentic desire to connect with each other. That is the reason that they're, you know, giving up their sleep time to instead hallucinate about one another for however much time a night. So like, yeah, there are all of these moments that come up where if you follow out the the narrative, you see, oh, like maybe even that person was exploiting that other person in some ways, but then it turns out that really they wanted to build an authentic relationship. And so that's like, why they you know did like 30 uh uh like psychic mediation medium sessions with one another even though it seemed for a while like that was one of them like tricking the other one things like that so you see this like sense that like the communities want to come together and yet like that process is like continually being co-opted and turned sinister by merchant soft and the fact that we rely on these platforms run by corporations in order to do that kind of like connection uh, but then you see again that like that that co-optation and capture is like is actually always being escaped at the same time. So like the cool punk page, it turns out one guy turns his own home like personal page into this like portal that starts this new thing called uh got fungal fungus fungus something. I'm inclined to say fun. fungus core, but I don't want to try to look it up because then it'll take me longer than it should. Yeah, but that's yeah, totally fine. It's, a, yeah. It's, got, it's, it's got cave sounds and yes. echoey distortion. But there's something about that too, formally, that's interesting. So I think that the argument that it's making isn't just like people are always trying to escape and create their own communities that are structured the way they want them to within these platforms. And they're always trying to find like the exception or the way in which they can like subvert what the platform is trying to do, which is, you know, make the entire music art scene about uh, Coca-Cola essentially or whatever uh, it's showing how like innovations in form and technology can produce that so like the mushroom page looks completely different from mm -hmm. everything we've seen before and it seems almost like it's like they invented CSS or who knows what like there's some kind of new set of like technical abilities that produce a new set of like social spatial because that's how hypnospace thinks about the social arrangements and so I think that gives us a chance to think maybe not utopian or dystopian thoughts, but a chance to think like strategically or mm. tactically about like how people need the ability to choose the structure of the communities that they're in, but that that ability is like uh, dependent on a kind of know-how that we need to develop in like mm. a grassroots emergent way. Mm -hmm. So I, I agree with you, Catherine, and I think I completely uh, am convinced by your reading, uh, but I'm just going to play the devil's advocate here because I do think that like there is, I'm also thinking of like the narrative itself, like how it moves and, you know, again, spoiler alert, there's like a, not good things happen with hypnospace uh, as you move around, uh, move along the storyline. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm kind of like almost sort of uh, reminded of this argument by one of our finest sort of um, art historians and theorists, Jonathan Crary, about like how sleep is one of the only times that uh, we have in our daily lives that's kind of like outside of the capitalist processes, like right? outside of the regular sort of um, grind, so to say. Uh, and so... The fact that this game, and I think here is where like the science fiction part, the speculative element really comes in, is that it's not just a game about the internet. It's not just like you're using internet in 1999, you are using it while you're sleeping, right? It's the hypno, like as, as, as Catherine pointed out. I think the fact that it's this sort of an encroachment of like the one time where I'm otherwise, uh, you know, not working and codification of that as work, um, makes me a little less hopeful, right? Like, I mean, I, th I think, yeah, I think we can be tactical with what we do when we sleep, but maybe sometimes we just need to sleep. Like we need to get our eight hours in uh, so that we can go to work the next day, but maybe we should just sleep. Um, well, to put a bow on this, the music genre is called fungus scene and it quote, incorporates drippy cave sounds and guttural gurgling synths. So the kind of like gross textural body horror undercurrent of this game continues here um, along with the, uh, uh, what is it, Catherine, the orifice? 
festering orifice. I think that's that's what I'm gonna that's that's one puzzle I'm gonna continue to think about is like the way that and actually, Renjo, you just talked about sleep. I mean, you're talking about biological cycles. There is something about like the the biological, the um, visceral continuing to kind of like erupt back into this space that is in theory intended to be manicured that that is like happening in this game i'm not really sure if it totally pays off or ends up defining the experience but it um perhaps it you know poetically gets at something related to what catherine is saying about people wanting to connect but only having these like limited and heavily mediated virtualized ways to do it and so you get these like eruptions of the physical back into it i don't know that that feels very 2020s to me uh in an age of like wearables and vr emerging uh to be doing something about the early internet where people keep trying to like render bodily experience of the experiences that don't quite come across in these like flat kind of heavily pixelated and compressed interfaces as well so that's something that everybody can keep pondering as they pick up this game but um Thank you both so much for your insights and for uh, uh, giving me a bunch of um, uh, additional epiphanies and things to think about through this conversation um, and, and just for taking the time to play through the game and, and uh, chat with me about it. Um, so I, for people watching, um, you should seek out the two uh, of these folks' works. You can learn more about Catherine and her work at uh, Catherine, www.catherinebuse.com. Uh, and uh, learn more about Ranjod and his work at www.ranjoddaliwal.com. And I will include those links in the uh, description uh, for this episode as well. Um, so you won't have to puzzle out different name possibilities uh, in terms of spelling. Um, we're excited to, to share more of these uh, CSI skill tree episodes in 2024. So to be notified about them, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash imagineasu. Or you can uh, visit our website, which is csi.asu.edu, uh, where you can subscribe to our uh, email updates. Um, so thank you once again, Catherine and Renjod, for being here today. And I'd, I'd also like to thank my colleagues at the Center for Science and the Imagination for uh, making this series possible, and especially to Devin Hakal for uh, editing uh, this video and editing the gameplay uh, that went into it. So. Thank you both so much. Uh, have a great rest of the day and happy enforcing. Thank you, Jay. Thank you for having us. <laughs>